My name is Charles Lowell. I'm here to talk about uh, the Ruby Racer. Uh, I don't know, can I get a quick show of hands how many people have actually used uh, the Ruby Racer? Okay, not too many. So, okay, so we're, we're starting from scratch. It's, it's good, it's good. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what it is, why you might want to use it, and then we're actually gonna go through and uh, do some, some pretty deep code samples, uh, just so you can see kind of the things that are possible with it. And um, because of that, I think it's probably better if you have a question to just stop me. I know we're supposed to do Q&A at the beginning, but uh, I think it's better to, to understand everything up front because the, the examples build on each other. So if, you know, don't be shy, just stop me and we can, we can all, uh, we can all um, go over it together. Um, so, the Ruby Racer uh, allows you to embed uh, the Google V8 JavaScript engine right there uh, into uh, your, your Ruby process. Um, it does this via a, a C extension and lets you have all the power uh, of, of that JavaScript engine right there. Um, but why might you want to do this? Well, one reason, obviously, is uh, the, the new hotness is, is Rails 3.1. Big controversy, it comes with CoffeeScript enabled by default. Uh, CoffeeScript is implemented in, in JavaScript, and so it uses a uh, gem called execjs to compile your CoffeeScript into JavaScript. And uh, if you have it installed, the default runtime actually is the Ruby Racer. So you, you may be using it only, uh, you know, only by, only by uh, accident, uh, but, not, but not directly with several uh, layers in between you. Um, but that's, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of other uses um, and uh, that we'll, we'll go over quickly before we get into the code. Um, the, first, the first one is unit testing JavaScript. This is actually the very first uh, use that we ever used it for. It's a great entry point um, because with the Ruby Racer you can actually spin up a, a, a JavaScript environment, load whatever you want into it and it doesn't require a display, it doesn't require a browser, so you know, this is what we use on our CI server. We actually use uh, JS DOM and Node HTML parser to simulate a browser environment, and we can run all of our JavaScript tests uh, on our CI server, and we don't have to worry about uh, having, having displays or anything like that, and they run really, really fast. Um, so that was, the, that was the first one. The other thing is, right now, there's an absolute explosion, a Precambrian explosion of, of, of diversity in the JavaScript environment that's going on right as we speak. Uh, a lot of this has to do with Node, um, but not necessarily, and there's just, uh, there's a lot of things that you can have access to that you can't if you just have a, a regular Ruby environment. So this is just by no means a complete list of the, the JavaScript utilities that we use every day uh, in our development and in production. Um, and it, I, I kind of compare it to being using JRuby. Uh, you have access to all these goodies that are implemented in other languages, in Java, in Clojure, Scala, all these, all these things. You've got access to all these great JavaScript libraries um, that aren't necessarily dependent on the DOM. Uh, and if they are dependent on the DOM, you can actually, have, there's DOMs implemented in JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> you can share code between uh, your client and server. I realize this is somewhat of a, uh, you know, the a holy grail for, for a lot of people, and there, I don't know if there's any particular right way to do it, but um, one of the things that we do is we, we share our views uh, implemented in mustache uh, and, and handlebars between our, our client and server. And I'm, actually, there's, there's people uh, who've contacted me on the list who are using, they're sharing their validation code, uh, and they're actually, there's some interesting stuff where they're actually implementing large parts of the business logic in uh, JavaScript, and then basically being able to include them uh, via Ruby modules uh, into their Ruby classes. Um, finally, there's performance. Um, we've only done a little bit of this, but uh, there have, some other people are doing this more extensively. Basically, uh, if you've got a tight loop or something that you need to optimize, uh, you can do it in JavaScript, which is a lot easier than C, uh, which is awesome. 
because nobody likes doing, nobody likes writing, writing C, especially it's just easier, faster. Um, and this is by no means an exhaustive list of why you would want to use it, uh, but I mean, people are coming up with, with new uses all the time. Uh, so we're just gonna go straight into how it works. Um, so first we have to ask the question, what exactly does it mean to have a JavaScript runtime there in your Ruby process? Uh, and this is something that it's a little bit of a, of a hill for people uh, to get over conceptually. Um, and for me, it means basically three things. Um, you can evaluate Ruby code and you can, or sorry, you can evaluate JavaScript code. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking, I'm creating a new V8 context. And what this is, is a completely and totally hermetically sealed JavaScript world. It's just got the JavaScript syntax. It's got the, as far as state, it just has those, you know, 10 objects, object function, uh, array, regex, just the, the standard JavaScript library, which is absolutely tiny. You can't access Ruby from it. There's no DOM. It's, it's Spartan. And this is one of the things that I, I love about it, because when you're embedding the JavaScript, whenever you create one of these new contexts, you've created a new world. You know, if, if, if programmers are gods, this is your world right here. And you can literally put anything you want into it. So you can see that once I've created the context, I can actually evaluate JavaScript code. So the, 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 the strings in there are actual JavaScript syntax. And I'm evaluating object, which actually returns the object constructor. You can see that's native JavaScript code uh, right there. Um, but you can do more than evaluate objects, or uh, you can do more than evaluate JavaScript code. You can actually get references to JavaScript objects directly. Uh, and they, they masquerade as Ruby references. So here, taking an example from the CoffeeScript homepage, <clears throat> we're actually going to evaluate this object literal uh, and assign it to the horse variable. And you can see that we can, we can actually pull it out of the context. And then from Ruby code, we can actually invoke that JavaScript method uh, and get the return value back into Ruby. Um, so um, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> actually, that's funny. The first two months of this project was literally getting that to work. Uh, you know, just striving for you know seg faulting and everything just to just to be able to get a reference to a, a JavaScript object and call a method on it. Um, luckily, we can do a lot more uh, with that. So um, there's a lot of of synergy between JavaScript objects and Ruby Ruby objects, but basically, JavaScript objects are just property bags. Um, they, they, they look kind of like a Ruby hash. So it makes sense that when you get a reference to them, you can use the hash syntax. Uh, you can just look up, uh, look up properties by name, and there they come. Uh, it's, there doesn't really make a difference if you use uh, a symbol or a, a string. It's the same deal. And uh, you can, you can uh, if you've got a valid if your property name is a valid Ruby identifier, you can just send it as a method and it'll do the right thing. And that's mainly because JavaScript objects, the, the methods are really just properties. Uh, so you kind of get that for free. But the other really interesting, you know, I always say that JavaScript only has two, two, two classes. There's just object and function. Uh, <clears throat> oops, sorry, one more thing about objects. Uh, you can assign also. So if you can see in this, this example, I've got my reference to uh, the JavaScript object. I evaluate that as an object literable. Then I actually set the value of company via Ruby. Uh, and then when I do my eval of JavaScript code, you can see that the, the value of company has been set via Ruby, but it's accessible now through JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> JavaScript objects are innumerable, so they, they look just like, uh, just like hashes. So here we have that same object, which is me. And uh, <clears throat> I just iterate through all the keys and values, and as expected, that uh, outputs that. So you can pretty much, you almost never need to use eval 
Um, that's one of the things that when people are starting out, you kind of realize you almost never need to use eval. You can do almost everything you want through, uh, through Ruby directly. And that's actually faster because you don't actually have to do the, the parse step. Um, so when it comes to, to accessing methods, it's a little bit wonky. Uh, it's mostly like Ruby. Mostly you don't kind of realize the difference, but there are some subtle differences, and that's because JavaScript functions are a little bit different uh, than, than Ruby functions. In JavaScript, methods are just properties uh, that happen to be uh, functions. So, <clears throat> and, and JavaScript functions are, they're, they, have, they can have more semantics with it. There's really, there's three ways that you can invoke a JavaScript function. You can invoke it as a bare function. You can actually pass a context to it, thereby setting what the this uh, variable will be. And you can also invoke any constructor in JavaScript, uh, or any, any function in JavaScript as a constructor. Um, so here's, the, here's an example of calling it as a proc. We're going to eval and get a reference, and so now what we have this greet object in Ruby is a reference to a JavaScript function. Uh, and then we're just going to invoke it with the call method. It, it, it looks like any other uh, Ruby callable, and uh, we're going to, it puts out greetings programs. Now notice, <laughs> this dot title is not defined. Uh, so there's, there's, there's it, it doesn't print it out. But there's another method um, on V8 function called method call. And that accepts uh, uh, an argument. And the first argument is going to be the, what, what gets set is the this variable. And then the rest of the arguments follow naturally. So you can see in this example, it's the same function, but we're invoking it differently. And it puts out uh, something entirely different. And finally, you can, you can invoke any JavaScript function as a constructor. And the way that you do this is there's actually a new method uh, on v8 function. Uh, so here we're actually defining a square constructor in JavaScript. I'm sure everybody's seen this example several times. And then we just created a new square with a radius of 10, and we can uh, invoke the area. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting here is if I were to take this away, would you, would you know that that wasn't a Ruby class at all, that that was actually pure JavaScript uh, that you were that you're using? So I think, that's, I think that's something neat, something to think about. And we'll actually see the converse of that later. Um, <clears throat> so again, that's, um, you have to remember that uh, JavaScript methods are just, just happen to be functions. One of the interesting consequences of this is you can do this. This is something you can do in, uh, in um, you can do in Ruby, but it's a little, bit, uh, a little bit more cumbersome, is you can just pick a function property off of one object and then invoke it on another. So here we've got two squares, but we're going to pull the, the, um, the, the area function off of the first square, and we're actually going to invoke it on the second square. Uh, and that's, that's exactly how you would do it in uh, JavaScript, except you've got Ruby, Ruby syntax. So to summarize, you know, part of what it is is being able to call. You can evaluate JavaScript. You can call JavaScript from Ruby. Later, we'll see how you can call Ruby from JavaScript. Um, but this is, you know, this this half of the bridge uh, is is being able to evaluate JavaScript code directly, being able to get in there and muck about with, uh, you know, the, the properties of a JavaScript objects, and be able to invoke JavaScript functions all from all, all from Ruby. Um, but the other side, because right now, so far, we've only talked about being able to invoke JavaScript from Ruby. But it wouldn't be the, that interesting unless you could also have your JavaScript code calling back into your Ruby code. And so now we're going to see how to do that. So here we've got a, a, a simple class, class dog. It's got one method, uh, one method bark. And we're going to take an instance of that Ruby object and put it inside of our V8 context. And you can see that I can just say rover.bark, just, like, uh, just like it was a normal JavaScript object. And it will actually invoke the, invoke the Ruby class, or invoke the Ruby method. You can do the same thing. I, could, I, I don't actually have to in, uh, embed the instance. I can just uh, take a bound method. So I'm going to pull, peel the, the, the bark method off of the, the dog object. And I'm just going to embed that in the context. 
And I can evaluate that from JavaScript. Uh, same thing with procs and lambdas. Uh, I can just define a lambda and put stuff it right inside the context, and then it's, a, it's uh, available from JavaScript. Uh, one thing that's actually interesting is you want to use lambdas and not procs because uh, I've actually run into this before. This is an interesting aside that you know procs actually return, keep their where they're going to return. So if you actually have a return inside of a proc, you can totally blow out the entire V8 stack uh, because Ruby will do a jump and it won't call any of the destructors. Uh, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually, I don't even think there's a way I can solve that uh, problem except probably in the future I'm going to disallow procs. Um, <clears throat> so uh, another thing that's interesting is you can actually embed a class right into your context. And that will, <laughs> that will um, create a, a, a corresponding JavaScript constructor, which when invoked will create an instance of the Ruby class and return a reference to it in JavaScript. So here we've got our same dog class, and we're just going to take that class object and put it right in there, and we can, we can instantiate it, and away we go. An interesting side effect is that you can actually extend Ruby classes from JavaScript. So here I've got my, remember that embedded dog class, I can actually access the prototype object of that dog class uh, define the bark and wag function, and then you can see it will call woof woof wag, the, the, the bark being implemented in Ruby, and the bark and wag being implemented in JavaScript. So I, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's something a little bit confusing, but it's neat that you can do that. And it does, uh, it's not purely academic, it does come into, uh, is useful sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so, when you actually have, so we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, getting references and, and uh, invoking Ruby functions. Um, you can do all of your property access uh, the same way. So I'm going to define, define a quick struct, and I'm going to try and read the properties of that struct uh, from JavaScript. And you can see there, you know, my name and my, my city are available to the JavaScript runtime. Uh, the same thing goes with being able to set, set values. So I'm actually going to set my name to my full name from JavaScript, and that's going to invoke the, the accessor function, the Ruby accessor function. Uh, so here I've defined it in a struct, but it could be if, if you've got you know, a name equals method, it will invoke that and it'll, it'll, actually, uh, it'll actually set it. Um, and then the other thing that you, you can do is when, when a, a, a property is not there, or you want to do a dynamic uh, hashy access, uh, you, can, you can do that from JavaScript too. So here we have uh, a processes class. And what this does is it just takes a username, finds all the processes associated, or finds the processes uh, associated with that username, and then returns an array uh, of, all those, of all those processes. Um, so here we're going to take that processes object, embed it into a JavaScript context, and then you can see when I invoke it, I've got uh, you know, my processes, root processes, and then if the user doesn't exist, we just get uh, an empty list. But uh, from the, 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 the perspective of the JavaScript code, um, it has no idea. It, you know, it, it looks like they're just static properties on that object. And this is, uh, this is actually this is how you implement the method missing uh, property or, or uh, pattern in, in JavaScript. You just implement a, a hash accessor on your Ruby object uh, that's embedded, and there, there you go, you've got it. Um, which is something you can't do uh, with a normal JavaScript runtime, at least not with, with a, the, the ones that are available in the browser. So, <clears throat> to summarize that side of the bridge, you know, we've, you can access JavaScript from Ruby, you can access the Ruby from JavaScript. Um, and uh, so, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, you know kind of future future plans for the project. Um, this one I think is really important. I want to get safe eval in there, and what safe eval is is something that probably is actually happening right now in the room, especially for people who aren't paying attention and are browsing the web. It's where you're actually going out and you're 
pulling down untrusted anonymous JavaScript code and you're running it on your machine, which is a totally insane thing to do. I remember back in the 90s when I started doing Perl code, you know, I thought eval was so awesome. And I remember the more senior developers on the team were like, do not ever, ever, ever call eval. <laughs> it's, it's the most evil, terrible thing uh, that you can do. And I got basically the same message uh, in Ruby. Um, but in JavaScript, eval is no big whoop because you don't have, you know, you don't, you don't have a, a, an environment that, that where scripts can do anything. Um, and, we, and, and this, I think, has enabled, um, well, it's, it's enabled so much advance in technology, the, the fact that you can pull down an untrusted code and run it in your browser. And I think that one of the next big things is going to be taking that to the server side, where servers and applications and platforms can just pull in all this untrusted Java code or JavaScript code and run it um, and, and not have to worry. Uh, and the, the companion gem for this, the Ruby Rhino, which is actually uh, implemented in uh, Java, it uses the Rhino, uh, already does this. Um, and I can tell you it's extremely powerful. The problem is, is we need to, in, for the Ruby racer, we need to be able to avoid constructs like this uh, and be able to, when, if someone sets a malicious while loop, <clears throat> we need to be able to detect that and just terminate execution. Um, we need to make it okay, no big whoop for people to do stuff like allocate billions and billions of objects until the heat blows out. And V8 does have support for, uh, for these type of things. You can put on, on each context, you can put a limit on the heap. Uh, there's, some, there's definitely some, some hoops that you have to jump through to get it to terminate execution. Uh, you have to do a bunch of threading and, and all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, and then, obviously, this is kind of, this is one of the biggies for, for languages other than uh, JavaScript. So like Java and Ruby and, uh, well, pretty much any, any, any server-side language. They have APIs like this, which are dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> in JavaScript, you kind of get this for free. Because if, you know, if, if, there's, if there's a world without guns, then nobody's going to be able to shoot anybody. And so because the, the JavaScript API literally has nothing in it, uh, that lets you do anything but really, you know, churn the CPU. Uh, you're 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 going to be just fine. And so one of my biggest priorities is to get to to, to allow you to do these things safely. Uh, and really, the third bullet point you get for free. So you can look for that. Um, other stuff. Uh, Multi-threading is definitely a, a, a challenge. I've actually since since uh, the release candidate for Rails 3.1 came out. People filed a lot of issues, and there's been a lot of hardening in this area. So pretty much uh, nowadays, you can uh, you can run the Ruby Racer in a multi-threaded environment, uh, and you're only going to have to, to <clears throat> you're only going to have to worry about it if, if you're doing really really advanced stuff. Uh, the other thing is custom heap snapshots, and what this means is is V8 actually supports the ability to serialize its entire heap to, to disk. And then you can, when you're starting up the interpreter, you can just thunk that thing right into memory and you're off to the races and there you go. And that's one of, that's one of the ways it uh, achieves, one of the many ways that it achieves the speed that it does. And so what you can do is you can actually create custom, uh, custom, custom heaps. So if you have a bunch of objects and class hierarchies and everything that you, you use um, a lot and use, uh, you know that are going to be in your application, you can just go ahead and, and uh, serialize those structures and just thunk it right into memory. Uh, and um, they also now have support for having completely and totally separate V8 uh, interpreters uh, inside a single process. Um, so that, that'll be neat to get in. <clears throat> Let's see. So challenges that uh, I had when, when developing this, um, garbage collection. This turns out to be horrendously complex uh, when you've got two garbage collectors that don't even don't know about each other, and you've got to manage their, but they're holding references to each other. You've got objects from one VM holding references uh, to to another, um, and just tracking down memory leaks and seg faults and stuff like that. I mean, it's 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 hairy. Um, you know, another challenge has been garbage collection. 
Uh, <laughs> MRI, Rubinius, JRuby all have different garbage collect <laughs> collectors, and so it's actually trying to get them to play nice uh, with, you know, trying to get it so that you can have one solution that connects the V8 garbage collectors to all these different, because, because the syntax of, of the Ruby runtime that you're using is the same, and by and large, they're all very compatible, but the way they manage memory is extremely different, and so it's difficult to, to talk to it. And finally, you can guess it, garbage collection. Man, this, is what, this has been the biggest headache of, of developing uh, um, <clears throat> this system. It turns out that V8 has, it's finicky about certain objects need to be collected between others, and whew, man, a lot of effort goes into garbage collection. <clears throat> but hopefully it provides, it, it provi I, my goal is to provide an interface so that you don't ever have to worry about it, because that's what garbage collectors are about, is really stuffing, sweeping that complexity under the rug uh, so, that, so that you don't have to worry about it. You can just worry about connecting your JavaScript and Ruby worlds. <clears throat> and finally, just a, a quick quick list. Uh, you know, I want to make. I, I really do want to make it uh, um, so that it's it's rock solid. We talked about the security. It runs quickly and it's cross-platform, and it's easy to install and 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 all that good stuff. But really, the reason is because it's been so empowering to me, and I want everybody to, 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 to be able to kind of let their imagination run wild and not, uh, not get, get bogged down in, in, in the little details. Um, I mentioned at the, at, the, um, <clears throat> at the beginning of the talk all the people who've, who have come to me with novel usages that I really did not foresee or, or you know, really couldn't have imagined. And you know, I, I want to keep that, I want to keep that coming. Uh, because I think that, you know, with, with exec.js, that really is just the beginning. We're really starting to see the power of being able to have a JavaScript runtime uh, right there inside your Ruby process. And I think it's only going to grow uh, from here. And, I, I, you know, I think that in five, five years, I hate to make predictions, but, you know, this is something that's going to be, you know, extremely commonplace. Um, <clears throat> so to that end, uh, if anyone wants to help out, Please, uh, <laughs> please, uh, please contact me. Please let me know. You know, right now they're, they're, uh, it's it's pretty much me doing this. Um, so while I have great plans and would love to 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 see it advance, um, sometimes it does not go as quickly as uh, as people would like it. So I hack every Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. Central uh, on it. So feel free to, to join in. I have a little WebEx conference going and we can screen share and you know, you might have fun, might learn something, might, might teach me something. So, <clears throat> thank you. So, any questions? Was garbage collection a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> garbage collection. Are, are, uh, are your slides available anywhere? Because I wanted, I, there's a lot of code samples yeah. that I could get, but I just couldn't type that fast. Yeah, yeah. No, um, my, the, the, the slides are available on SlideShare. I'll go ahead and I've actually updated uh, these slides for um, just recently, so I'll put the most recent versions. I think I've got uh, better, better samples, more simple samples than what's, what's on the internet. Yes? One of your points was about how you wouldn't have to use C because you could do this and because it was just as fast. And I, I was kind of like not processing exactly how you, what, what measures have you done about how fast it is to run this kind of thing as opposed to like native C? I haven't personally done uh, any measures. Once again, this is, this is something that someone has contacted me. They did actually uh, post some, uh, some gists showing the speed up, uh, but <clears throat> I mean, the the it, it relies on you know this is this is basically nothing that I've done but it relies on V8 which has you know which can can compile your JavaScript down to native code uh, and so um, it's just it's just fast uh, so I, I can I can actually try and um, dig up some of the metrics uh, but but it basically relies on V8 and so you can you can look at the metrics there too. Do you have any specific examples of where this was useful? 
of where this was useful. So we use it, we use it for uh, every day for doing uh, JavaScript testing. Um, we use for, for our CSS preprocessor, I know SAS is really popular, but we have a very large investment in less. And I don't know if anyone follows less, but about a year and a half ago, Alexis Sellier, the guy who developed it, jumped, you know, jumped out of the Ruby community into the Node community and re-implemented less in JavaScript. And we were kind of, you know, and then basically stopped doing any development on the less Ruby interface. So what we did was take the Ruby racer and just pull the less JavaScript and compile it that way. So we actually, we actually uh, open sourced that, I think, about uh, two months ago. So if you, if you actually install the less 2.0 gem, uh, it, uses, it uses this to compile it. So that's, that's an example. Um, and then, uh, gosh, people have, well, we use it for, like I said at the beginning of the talk, we use it for sharing templates uh, so we can render our mustache templates on the server. Um, and then that's, that, those, are, those are the ones that I actually have experience with. And then people have, have, um, have contacted me uh, you know, via the, the mailing list asking how to do stuff for uh, implementing validation logic in JavaScript. Um, there's a gem out there called include.js, which allows you to, to use JavaScript and wrap a Ruby module around it so that you can include Ruby modules that are actually where the methods are implemented in JavaScript inside your Ruby class. Um, so that's useful. I, I believe they use it for, for sh um, sharing business logic between their backbone models and their Rails models. So there's, there, there's a lot of use cases and I mean people, people are coming up with them all, new ones all the time. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Well, thank you.